Welcome to the All About Alts podcast, where we explore the world of alternative investing to help you find financial independence. Join our host, Newview Trust's president, Jason DeBono, as he covers a variety of topics with different guest speakers to discuss tax and alternative investing strategies. It is never too late to start taking control of your financial future, and we are so excited for you to be joining us for this opportunity to hear from some of the best in the business. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the All About Alts podcast. I am Jason DeBono, your host, and I am joined with an exciting guest today, Tim Mai. He is here from the Hero Capital Summit, but uh, runs a, quite a few different things under the Hero brand, which we're going to spend some time talking about. So, Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Uh, it's going to be fun today. And, you know, Tim, uh, T- Tim is one of the uh, the original uh, OGs, I think, is the way that it's coded today uh, by the youth. But he is an original in the uh, in the self directed IRA space. We were chatting about uh, going all the way back to hosting events you know, twenty plus years ago uh, for another IRA firm. Uh, and so, yeah, you, you've got quite a history with IRAs, Tim. Not often we can find someone with that much background. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, definitely been been a fun journey. I you know I been in real estate for 21 years now. I can't believe it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, when when I first started, uh, Quincy Long was just, uh, a, um, be, you know, be, before the IRA stuff, he was my title company, uh, uh, real estate attorney. And that's how uh, yeah, Quincy and I met years ago. Yeah, it's a small, small world. And, you know, it's amazing because your your journey uh, over the last 21 years has has really given you quite a scope and, uh, you know, kind of being here personally for 18, you know, years in in the IRA space. It's kind of interesting to see how both of these worlds have continued to evolve, yet yet they continue to come back and forth uh, and intersect quite a bit. And so we'll talk about that and maybe dive right in. You're, you're, uh, you're a Houston guy, went to University of Houston and uh, as a UCF guy, excited to see us both join the Big 12 this year. So uh, <laughs> that's exciting. But um, you know, you, you you got into real estate 21 years ago uh, doing single family. You know, I think like a lot of people enter the market, right? It starts with one property and then one becomes two and two becomes four. So tell us a little bit about that. So, you know, take us a, a little bit down memory lane. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I uh, a little bit about my background. Have you ever heard of the term Vietnamese boat people? Um, one of those. What it means is that it's a group of people that escape out of Vietnam on a boat, uh, made it to a, a refugee camp, um, and you know, and then work our way here to the U.S. So when my um, when when I was 11 years old, my brother was 18. The two of us, because uh, back then when a boy turns 18, it's automatic automatic draft into the communist uh, uh, government military. And so when my brother turned 18, my parents wanted him to be able to uh, try to escape out of the country. And he didn't want to go by himself. So he asked if I wanted to come along. I was like, sure, I'll come along, you know, because we, we tried to escape uh, several times, but, you know, not um, uh, we didn't make it out. So I thought I would just you know be back home anyway. So, yeah, so I left. Um, so my brother and I left. He was 18. I was 11 years old. We spent uh, a year in the refugee camp, uh, and then we came, we made it here to Houston in '87, 87, uh, 1987. And uh, yeah, so um, you know, grew up in the hood. <laughs> it was like two boys on the street. We had the 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 dream teenage life. You know, no no parental control. We could do whatever the heck we wanted to do, but uh, we did a lot of stupid stuff. And um, yeah, so. You know, fortunately, I was able to get out of that environment, and um, yeah, was able to uh, to to uh, f- you know finish school. And during college, I got recruited by an IT company uh, up in Dallas, and so I moved to Dallas to work for them uh, for 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 a couple of years. And then that was during the dot com uh, boom, and then the dot com bus came along, and we got laid off. Um, and so. I was forced to figure out what's next, um, and so I went to the bookstore, um, and uh, my very first book I read was uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad, and that introduced me to real estate, and uh, and so I moved back to Houston, got started in real estate investing, um, and like I share, you know, uh, Quincy was uh, one of the first people I met in the industry, 
Uh, I started out doing uh, fix and flip. So my very first deal, uh, Quincy was the one that closed the deal. I still have a copy of the check from when I, uh, I sold the deal too, and it came from his old title company. Uh, and uh, yeah, so um, so I did that and then did, you know, um, um, between flips and buy and hold. Um, and um, in, uh, uh, I think it was about a year later, I, I got a big office that has a, a, um, uh, a big room where we can do events and stuff. And so uh, right around that time, Quincy uh, bought Entrust. Um, and so he's like, hey, Tim, can I use your event to do uh, my monthly client mixers? So for the first year or so of, uh, of his Entrust, it was all done at my office. And I've gotten to, uh, you know, number one, get my own IRA, Roth IRA account and also work with a lot of um, uh, IRA, Roth IRA account holders uh, throughout the years. Uh, and we've done a, all kinds of deals through through our IRAs. Well, it's, you know, it's always exciting to hear kind of that perseverance, right? I mean, 11 years old and, and uh, you know, really escaping out of, of just a, a very difficult place, spending a year in a refugee camp, you know, coming with without any really parental guidance, which is not even the guidance side of it. It's the support and all that comes with that as well. And 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 being able to get through college and, and here we are, uh, you know, 20 plus years later, what an amazing um, um, story. So, you know, you're, you're in single family, right? You're, you're buying and selling, you've seen ups, you've seen downs, right? You yeah. went through the, the great recession and managed through that process. So, you know, let's start there, right? Cause I think it's something that for a lot of people, um, there's a lot of investors that, that say, oh, I've been doing this 10 years and 12 years and six years and not to take anything away from them, but you know, I remember I started in this business in 05 and 05 was different than 07 and 09 and, and 2011. You know, not many people have seen a, a, a really big fall and we're starting to yep. see, and I won't suggest it, it is a big fall or is not a big fall. I think, you know, uh, that story is continuing to be written, but we're in a cycle, right? Real estate and, and all asset classes are in different phases, but there's a cycle for sure. Rising interest rates, demand, all of these things are playing into it. But you've been through some of that, right? H yeah. How did how did you kind of navigate that? You know, in 2005, um, you know, you could put a for sale sign in front of anything and get more. Uh, and then yeah. 2009, you couldn't give away your property, literally. Yeah. Um, so h having been through that, you know, what lessons did you learn? What did you learn the hard way? Um, yeah. you know, where was oh my a little bit of luck on your side? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I'd lost a ton of money in that market crash for sure. Uh, I was really big into fix and flip at that time. So when the market, uh, turned, uh, in 08, I had 30 properties, uh, 30 houses in different stages of construction or for sale. And as you know, as you know, right overnight, um, we couldn't find any buyers for them. And so uh, I did what I can to convert some of them in rentals, but some of them, they were not meant to be rentals. Uh, right. You know, the, the, the kind of repairs we did for them and the, 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 the type of properties they are. But yeah, so um, the, you know, I, um, uh, like the lesson I've learned from that, w one of the big ones is at that time, I didn't know where to turn or who to turn to. And so I just, you know, sort of put my head in and try to figure it out all my, you know, all by myself. And, uh, and I, I make a lot of mistakes. It's just trying to figuring it out. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, now I know better now to seek for mastermind groups and seek for people like who've been there, done that and know how to navigate that market. Um, but I didn't know that back then. And with all that fix and flips, uh, I used a lot of private lenders' money uh, during that time as well. Luckily, um, you know, I've never like none of my private lenders ever lost money. I've lost a ton of money, and I have to put up money to pay them <laughs> to secure their position. But they've never had to lose money with me. Um, but yeah, like if, if knowing what I know now, like I would have came to them and 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 negotiate a a um, a payment structure that that would allow me to finish off these pro you know some of these properties off and um and 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 you know like maybe hold hold off the monthly payment so I can fix it rent it out get that cash flow and pay them and just, so yeah so I I was just I always knew to make 
my you know my private lenders uh because i know these people i mean that that's their time and account money right like that's you know that that's a lifetime savings there and so i know that i needed to take care of that money but um i put so much focus there that i i didn't have the money i need to finish fixing the property um you know and so so that yeah that 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 just put me in a in a real like crunch i have to do a bunch of wholesaling to earn the money to pay you know my rehabs and all yeah so so i i, I learned to navigate through that but i probably lost a good three million dollars through that whole process <laughs> um and so uh so yeah it's definitely it's a it's a painful journey but i've learned a ton um and you know now like i'm so ready for this market <laughs> i you know i yeah so in in that market i was so busy fixing what was there I, you know, I didn't even think to, hey, I need to buy and hold all of these properties while the price is dope cheap. Uh, I would, you know, I, I would be much better off now if I had done more of that. But I didn't. I, I you know, other than wholesaling just to cover the cash flow, I, I wasn't even in the buying uh, mode to hold at that time. And, uh, and yeah, so those are some of the lessons that I learned. Well, you know, there's a couple things I just want to highlight for our listeners, you know, in kind of having been through that process as well. And, you know, I was just out of college in 05. And so, um, you know, I really wasn't heavy into real estate at the time. And so it was, you know, created. So for me, I wasn't looking in at the market in in seven, eight, nine on what how to fix it. I was looking at opportunity, right? And and so I want to highlight lesson one is you know, even if you find yourself with assets that lose value, number one, don't be scared or despondent. Um, losing money is part of investing. And if if you only have winners, you're not aggressive enough, right? You're going to have some deals that go south. And, you know, if, if you're concerned about the market going and you sit on the sideline too long, right, you're going to miss a lot of upside, even though you yep. may catch a little of the downside. So, you know, in, in that lesson one is is always look for opportunity, no matter where you sit in the spectrum. And then you know, on top of that is don't be scared, um, yep. be smart, be deliberate. Um, but but that's certainly opportunity is always knocking in every single cycle up or down. The second thing that, you know, that that I think is really, really important. And, and I, I really appreciate the way you said it says a lot about you and your character. But, you know, if you're going to go out and borrow money, right. And, you know, we know that in the crash, people were giving their keys back to banks and um, but when when you're in the real estate investment world, you're typically not borrowing money from Bank of America. You know, it's from your neighbors. It's from, you know, friends and family. And so, you know, making sure that before you take that money in, make sure you accept, you know, to Tim's point, it was their retirement money. He had to make them whole. And yep. if and it again, it says a lot about you and your character. But if you're going to borrow money from people, you know, in a one to one relationship, then really be smart, be deliberate and have a plan. Um, because the last thing that you want to do is have to call someone you've known a long time and tell them you lost all their money and you got no way to make them whole. So good, good for you um, for Thank navigating you. through that. You know, it's it, it was a painful experience for many. Um, and who knows what this next cycle brings? It may be painful. It may not be painful. It may be, you know, imminently painful, depending on where you sit. Um, but in every cycle, new opportunities are created and and, and we'll certainly see that. How, you know, let's talk a little bit about your your kind of continued transition. So you're, you know, fixing and flipping 30, 40 homes at a time. You've got this machine, this monster, the market slows you down. And then it creates this new opportunity, which is, you know, where you're going, wait a minute, this cost me 300 grand two years ago. And now I can buy it and rehab it and sell it for 150 grand. You know, it almost seemed like but yet we didn't view it that way. It almost seemed like something was wrong. The, the houses were never going to go back up. This was the new normal. How'd you navigate through the other side of the, this, you know, which is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. When did you kind of start to realize, hey, wait a minute, you know, yeah, sure. I can cry about the, the millions of dollars I lost in 2008, 9 and 10. But when did you kind of turn and say, all right, enough looking out the rear view mirror, let's look out the windshield and let's start taking advantage of this new opportunity. Right, yeah, for sure. I mean, it it, it took me a few years to, to kind of dig myself out of the whole thing, but what it did for me was it had me run a, uh, a strong wholesaling operation uh, to have that cash flow. And so, yeah, so the um, when the market started to turn again in 2011, especially here in Houston, 
um, um, you know, yeah, I just started to just uh, ramp up the volume uh, even more and 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 start to to buy more, and then held you know held some as well. But yeah, I would say uh, uh, eight, nine, ten, and some of eleven. Even it was all like dealing with the issues I had in two thousand eight. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, and, and yeah, 2012, um, was, was when I, 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 uh, well, when I was able to take a, a breather and really focus in and, and, and ramp that up even more, uh, and then even got into, uh, other types of properties, especially in land, um, as well, because, you know, cause now people are starting to, to buy and fix, but, uh, builders also came back. Um, so I did you know, uh, land deals and flip land deals to, uh, to, to, uh, to builders also. And then, you know, you continued that journey and then you started getting in, you know, on the private lending side, but then you, you took the next transition, right. Which is into the commercial side of the world, multifamily. And, and you, you got on the other end of that, which is to, you know, on the fund sponsorship side, capital raising, how, how did you, what caused you to want to make that leap? And then ultimately how, uh, did you make that leap? Yeah. So, um, on the private lending part of it. So, um, what happened was, you know, here I have, all, you know, I've been working with private lenders for a while. Um, and so when, when I was able to recover, um, in 2000, like the whole 2012 market on, I had a lot of people that came to me and says, Hey, Tim, I want to you know learn what, you know, uh, uh, how to, how to do what you do with the fix and flip stuff. Um, and so, so I was teaching it and I was, uh, private lending to them. Um, and then, you know, it got to where it's like, okay, I, I don't have enough money to lend to them. So I, you know, some of my private lenders that was lending to me, I was like, Hey, you know, here are some of the people I've already vetted. Uh, if you want to lend to them. So I start also doing brokering of private, uh, money as well. And um, it wasn't until last year that I got into this commercial real estate space. And it's an interesting journey how that came about. But um, I, 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 met, I met a guy who's now a, a good friend of mine, Javier Hinojo. And um, we were talking and he said, you know, Tim, these days, each deal that I do add a million dollars to my net worth. I was like, what? Like... My fix and flip doesn't make anywhere that that amount for a deal, right? And so, so that got my ear open to, uh, you know, to this whole multifamily commercial space, and that's what he was doing. Is he was doing multifamily uh, syndications, and um, and then uh, at that time, my my son was turning sixteen, his daughter was turning sixteen, and uh, one of my uh, 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 mentors that I that I started with when I first started real estate, Robert Allen, um, I met him. And then, so, uh, so I, so I came up with the idea of, Hey, how about the three of us come together and create a program called the teen millionaire challenge, where we teach young people, uh, teens ages 16 to 19 years old, uh, real estate investing entrepreneurship. And the goal is that, you know, they, uh, they they amass at least a million dollars in net worth by the time they turn 20. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so the three of us started that. And then uh, Javier was the one that was the main instructor to teach them syndications. And through that process, I get to watch these young people. Um, like, so in that program, it was a year-long program, that group of teens, there was 19 of them, they must have made offers on and they underwritten and made offers on over two billion dollars worth of real estate. Wow. Yeah. And so through that process, like it 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 made me a believer. It's like, man, if these kids can do it, like I can do it. And uh and yeah, so that's how I that's how I got started in this syndication space. Uh, because for the longest time I used to think, and you know, as as much deals as, as I've done. And as much experience I have in the in the single family home space, I I still always had this limiting beliefs that these these apartment deals, these commercial deals, they're just too big, they're too complicated, you know, too too many moving parts. Um, you know, I was comfortable with my my single family homes and land stuff, um, and so yeah, so it it 
that limiting belief stopped me from going over here onto the syndication side. Um, and so, yeah, through that program, it opened up my eyes and, and, and my mind especially. Um, and so, so yeah, so I got started in the syndication space um, a little bit over a year ago. And now I'm also, I have a debt fund. We, uh, we loan money to land flippers. And then I'm launching a multifamily fund uh, that will invest specifically on multifamily. Well, you you uh, you never seem to amaze me, Tim, with all of the things that that you've got cooking. I love the 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 story of the the uh, the teens and and really helping them build wealth. What an amazing thing to be doing! And uh, it does. It just reminds us all that you know real estate investing, while it's very hard to master, has no barrier to entry. And you know all the reasons you think you can't enter that space really are just made up or artificial. If yeah. if a 16 year old with with truly limited resources, right? Knowledge, money, experience. The only thing they have is probably time and energy that, that we don't have. Um, if they can do it, why can't anyone else? So um, what, what a great way. We're going to segue over um, into our quirky questions of the day. We're going to break this up here for just a minute. Um, and then when we, when we come out of the quirky questions, we're going to dive into kind of this fun side of the world. You're, you're, uh, you, you host an event, you know, you're educator, you're a master connector. I want to talk a little bit about that and then maybe dig in a little into the marketplace, what we're seeing today, you know, where are, what inning of the cycle are we in and, and maybe where are we headed from here? So, um, all right, Tim, you ready? Quirky questions of the day. Thank you guys for uh, putting in your, uh, your submissions for questions. Always one of my favorites. Um, I will grab, I'm going top envelope today. Um, if you do have quirky <laughs> questions, make sure you get those submitted to Maggie with a Y at newviewtrust.com with a U. Tim, you ready? Yep. All right. Question one. If you could design a time travel machine, when and where would you go and why? Ha. Huh. Wow. I would I would go back to my beginning of my real estate career and skip the whole single family thing and go straight into <laughs> commercial. I so wish I have done that. I mean, that was 2002 amazing time to have done that um and so yes that's you know yeah i i would have you know um exponentially uh build my wealth and not just for me but um you know like i'm doing that now with my kids but if i had been there my kids would have grew, grown up in that whole uh commercial space they would have been used to looking at big deals and and you know uh, yeah and and used to the big numbers and all of that good stuff. All right. I like it. Back to the beginning and and uh, not getting out of real estate, just going straight for the big deals from the get-go. Yep. I like it. All right. Number two, if you could create a new flavor of pizza, what <laughs> toppings would you choose? New flavor of pizza. Huh. Definitely it has to be a shrimp pizza. <laughs> okay. I like shrimps. Um, All right. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't think they even have shrimp pizza right now, right? So that's a new flavor ish, I guess. I think it is. I, I uh, <laughs> I've seen it a couple of places, but it's a very rare thing to find. So <laughs> shrimp pizza, Tim. Maybe that's your next <laughs> idea. <laughs> All right, last one. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Huh. You know. I I love to go places where I can taste a bunch of different flavors. I don't I don't um, so I get a little bit of everything. I don't have attachment to one. However, mango is my favorite fruit, so I love everything mangoes. How? But the ch the tricky part about mangoes is my wife is allergic to it. So if I eat it, I can't kiss her for that day. I have to brush <laughs> my teeth. I have to do. I have to like let it you know sit. For the next day, so that's the that's the other part to it. But uh, I would, I guess, if I have to pick one flavor, it would be mangoes. All right. Well, so mango has a couple different things. It's it's not just the flavor; uh, it's also an element of risk that uh, that it brings. So you know, it, it's easy to know if you and your wife have have had a uh, a a fight in the morning because that's when you're eating all the mango ice cream. Um, so good to know, Tim. We uh, well, I I I always love. Ice cream discussion is one of my favorite things. And um, I am a uh, no fruit in my ice cream guy. 
So, you know, I find you're you're either on one side of the coin or the other. So it uh, sounds like you're you're not only good with fruit, but you're going mango. <laughs> yes. Tropical Off all again. the way. <laughs> thank you for participating in the quirky questions of the day. And thank you to the listeners that keep submitting those. Uh, I, I always enjoy it. You never know what you're going to get and you never know what you're going to hear. So um, let's uh, let, let's get back to. Um, you know, where we left off, we were, you know, kind of talking about Tim's journey and how he, you know, started in real estate and and kind of worked his way up and most recently has made the transition into the commercial side and, um, you know, bigger deals, bigger numbers, but significantly bigger opportunity. One of the things that I didn't mention at the beginning when we talked a little bit about Tim is, you know, Tim's not just a, a, a longtime investor that knows a lot of people, seen a lot of deals, very well connected. Um, but Tim's also the master connector. Um, he's always hosting events, uh, whether it be on, uh, you know, over the the last 20 years on the real estate side uh, for individual investors or single single family investments. Um, but now you've got the Hero Capital Summit uh, that you host. You've got your second annual coming up uh, here in the middle of September. So at, at a high level, what what is that the the Capital Summit? What uh, you know? Why did you start something like that? And and what is the goal of putting on an event like that? Yeah, so coming into this space, you know, there's um, there's a lot of different roles I can choose to play, whether it's, you know, being an operator, being an asset manager, uh, being a capital raiser. So I, I, I looked at, okay, what what would play the best to my strength and my, my skill sets? Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, I'm very well connected because I've been in the industry for so long um, and, uh, and I've done a lot of things in this industry. And so I uh, so coming into this in industry, I decided that I want to focus in on the capital raising aspect of the business. Uh, what that means is that, you know, I have these funds where we raise money for our funds and then our fund invests into uh, these different deals. And we, you know, because I'm well connected, I know who's the you know top players, or I know who the ones that are doing well, who's not, um, and so I can best direct the money to um, to the good operators that I would invest my own money in. And so, uh, so yeah, so um, so I wanted to learn as fast as I can, um, you know, about capital raising from the top, you know, uh, syndicators and fund managers in our industry. And so I started a uh, a community, a Facebook group on capital raising, and a weekly virtual meetup on capital raising, where I interview guys that have raised at least uh, fifty million dollars or more. Um, and uh, and so this live event uh, uh, is an extension of that whole community uh, of syndicators, fund managers coming to this uh, uh, in-person event to network, to get to know each other. Uh, so that way we can, you know, um, uh, fund each other's deals, invest in each other's deals, know, you know, who who the good um, who the good operators are, who's who are the ones in trouble. So we mastermind on those kind of things, so that way we always have a good post in the marketplace, because uh, we want to, you know, we want our own money to to be well invested, uh, and our investors' money to be well invested, and so. So that's um, yeah. So the event is specifically for the people who are active uh, operators, syndicators in the industry, and they're coming to learn about capital raising um, and connect with other you know other syndicators and capital raisers. Well, it's amazing, and and events are um, you know there's so many opportunities to learn. I mean, we live in a world today you know where there's really no excuse to not learn something new or or know something, but the power of connection in this space is is big and understanding capital raising is is massive i think a lot of people they love the idea of buying real estate and and maybe they love these big deals but there's an element of raising the funds right that that mm -hmm. allow these deals to happen because without it um none of these deals are getting over the finish line so it's 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 really critical let's talk a little bit about the capital raising market i mean certainly um you know the the market has slowed down naturally yep. um two years ago three years ago um, you know, there was the, there wasn't a lot of option. You didn't want idle money, right? Idle money um, didn't pay. And, and so there was a lot of opportunity. Um, we had COVID, right? We had a lot of people that had a lot of extra time on their hands to, to really 
focus in on more wealth building. And so we had this kind of big flood in the capital markets, especially on the the, the private real estate side. So we started to see a slowdown now. What, what are you seeing out in the marketplace from your standpoint? Um, you know, let's start on the sponsor side. If if you were going to go and, and, and find the right deal and raise 20 million bucks today, what would be different for me today and raising that money maybe than a couple of years ago? You know, what are you seeing and, and yeah. what, what should I or could I expect? Yeah. So it's definitely a lot harder to raise money for now than it was the last couple of years. Uh, so what you would expect is to put in a lot more work. <laughs> so if you had to, you know, if you had to contact a hundred people uh, last time, you're gonna have to contact at least five hundred, or maybe even a thousand people now uh, to raise the same amount of money. Um, and the big part of it is not so much that the opportunities are not there, the, um, but it's the it's the the media, you know, instilling fear in the marketplace that have a lot of investors kind of. Um, uh, afraid to 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 do anything right now, and so so yeah, so we do have to overcome that. Uh, and yeah, as an operator, obviously knowing what's happening in the market and knowing that the opportunity is there, there's no reason to rush into a deal. Uh, you know, if if a deal is marginal, don't even bother with it, right? There's plenty of good deals that are already starting to come to the, come on the market, um, and so so yeah. But it, I mean, you know, it's. Um, uh, Cap, it's still the same, just a ton more effort to uh, to raise. <laughs> yeah, and and you know that that market um, in terms of raising money, you know, it doesn't look like it'll get easier anytime sooner. You know, I think you're you nailed it in terms of the media and and you know, but the alternative for a lot of people today is that you know they've got just sitting in cash pays. Now we could sit here and talk about how that doesn't really pay. You know, you're you're never going to keep You're only getting a, a premium on your dollars today, but you're barely keeping up with inflation. So overall, you yeah. know, it really doesn't pay to sit in cash. But, you know, if you're an investor that's used to making zero on their cash and you're making 5% on a CD, it's hard to, to justify that. So, you know, I think it's something that as a, a market, um, you know, the uncertainty of the real estate market is keeping people from maybe rushing into it. And you couple that with 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 really nothing pushing them into it. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't think we'll see much of a change there, but I, I love, uh, you know, Tim, that you brought up, you're already starting to see some good deals, right? And as we talked earlier, you know, for someone that's been through this and through the worst of the worst and, and felt that burn really, you know, at, at your own fingertips, you know, your biggest regret is missing opportunity, yeah. right? And so, you know, people sitting on the sidelines today, um, while they may not be trying to fix the the things that have already happened in the past, maybe they're not caught up in in, in any anything that's maybe causing them pain. It's that missed opportunity. What what are you seeing on the individual side? You know, if um, I'm an individual investor, I've got uh, let's just say my retirement money, or I've got some cash. You know, things have quieted down on investments I may normally make myself, or maybe I don't want to. You know, I don't personally feel comfortable buying a deal in today's market. So, you know, it's a perfect opportunity to go find another deal or to go invest into a fund or something where I'm leveraging someone else's experience. What guidance or, or you know, advice would you would you have for someone like me that's got, let's just say, a hundred grand and I'm going, where do I put it? Right. How do I evaluate due diligence? What's that look like? And, and right. you know, yeah. What do you suggest? Yeah, definitely. You know, in in the in the last few years, I mean, you can be a dummy and make money in real estate. Like there, there wasn't the market, you know, drove everything. And so, uh, but in today's market, the the strength of the operator is super super important, right? So critical um, because they're you know they're the, the the CEO and the COO to get that investment to perform, um, and so. Uh, yeah, so so ideally, you find someone like myself that been through the last market crash, know how to get you know uh, like navigate through that. Uh, but uh, even if they haven't been through the last market crash, um, you know, making sure that they 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 invested in you know at least a few years, I say at least three years, um, and and you know have been through because right now. You have insurance costs, uh, you know, has rise up significantly. You have property taxes rise up significantly. So, like, you know, an 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 operator that have uh, have deals went full cycle. They've been through the, you know, through through some of these um, um, 
changes in the marketplace. So they know how to navigate through that um, and, and that they have experience in managing a similar asset. So, you know, when it comes to like, and I'm, I'm just going to speak from my personal experience of what I look for, for, for my own investment. I do, when it comes to my passive investing, when it comes to my active, I'm a risk taker. I'm willing to take risks. When it comes to passive investing, I want as close to a sure thing as possible. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I don't want to take chances on new guys coming into the marketplace. I want guys that already been there, that already, you know, um, have experience managing those assets. And so, so yeah, so I look for, I look for proven operators to partner up with, like even with our funds, right? So we, you know, um, as fund managers, we raise money for our fund and then we invest that in, with top operators. So all the people that we invest in, they all, all have over $100 million asset in management. They already all have deals that gone full cycle. They've been through the market cycles. Um, so they know how to navigate through that. And so, yeah, so we, so that's what I recommend. Uh, if you're looking at passive investments is that you, do, you, you look at um, like those type of operators, operators that have the experience uh, to take that asset, you know, through successfully. Um, that was, that's the number one thing. Look at that first before you look at the deal, before you look at the returns, because, you know, a new guy might come in and offer you a 40% return, but if he doesn't perform, you might right. even lose your money. You might have a negative 40% or negative 100% of your money, right? Yep. Uh, you know, versus a proven operator, maybe he's only offering 15%, 17%, but they're proven, right? So it's a much uh, uh, stronger uh, investment than, than a newer person promising more. Well, you know, it reminds me of my two favorite Warren Buffett quotes, right? One is, uh, return of principle is always better than return on principle. And yep. uh, I, I can't tell you how many times looking at a deal, you know, where you it, it's the ultimate risk mitigator, because once you realize that, yeah, the the 40 percent return sounds great. But when you step back and go, how likely if, you know, will this go bad or is it likely it can you realize, yeah, the higher the return, the more likely, you know, the the negative return is. And so I, I love that one. And then the second one is the, um, you know, it's um you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. Yep. And, you know, we've been in, in a market and, you know, you pointed it out perfectly. So is that, you know, everybody's made money in real estate when times are great. And we just kind of assume that it's like a light switch, right? You either make money, or you don't in real estate. And the reality is people make money in real estate all the time in every cycle. But what you have is you have a lot of people that, that only made money without really understanding the fundamental investment, you know, um, philosophy and those are the ones that, you know, when you look at their track record, probably aren't going to have enough on paper to justify. And in today's market, um, I think your your advice is so prudent, Tim, is like, hey, let's not penalize someone for being new in the market. Everybody has to get their start somewhere. But today's not the day for me to be yep. investing in someone's first deal, you know, or if it is, then it, I know that it's a riskier investment, but I got to at least know that. So um, I, I, I really subscribe to that same philosophy. I think there's deals to be had. I think if you're not looking at deals today, you're missing opportunity, um, but it's gotta be the right deal. Yeah. And one, one additional thing I want to add. So for myself personally, I actually do background checks on, uh, people I invest with. Um, you know, if I have their permission, great. If not, I do background checks on them anyways, <laughs> you know, because that's because these days, you know, as long as you have a name, uh, like it's easier to do background checks. But yeah, um, you know, I, I recently I was, uh, you know, I was looking at a, a um, investment opportunity, and after I do the background check, I was like, uh, like not as clean as I, not bad, but not as clean as I I want it to be. So so I pass up on it. So yeah. Uh, that's, you know, that's one that not a lot of people, especially, um, you know, LPs, right? Uh, passive investors, a lot of uh, uh, LPs do not do that background checks. For us, like for our fund, we do background checks on all of the operators that we invest in. Uh, like that's just part of our procedures because, yeah, you never know what comes up. Um, and so, yeah. Well, due diligence is critical. And, you know, it, when you're going to trust your money in the hands of somebody else and you're going to relinquish that control, you reserve the right to to have as many points of confidence as you need to move forward. So, 
yeah, I, 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 uh, I appreciate you kind of pointing that out because it's something that, you know, a lot of, a lot of LP investors don't ask nearly enough questions. You yeah. know, they just don't. And, and what's the right amount of questions? I don't know. Right. But I know it's not one or two. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's something that, uh, yeah, I think, you know, we'd collectively encourage anyone that's considering any investment, you know, do your due diligence, um, ask, um, you know, I'm reminded of a time many years ago, we had someone that called in and, and, uh, our CEO actually was, was talking to her and, um, she had said, you know, this, this is this investment and I want to put all my money in it, you know, and we're not advisors. We don't, you know, we're a self-directed custodian. And, um, you know, he just had asked her, Hey, you know, um, when you say all your money, do you know, she just knew so little, like, 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 I don't really know this. I don't really know that. And he just, you know, said, Hey, listen, we're here happy to help. But, you know, one thing we always encourage is that you go and do some due diligence. It's really important. You know, we're not going to do that for you, right? That's not our role. And if, if, if anyone is suggesting that we're doing the due diligence, it's probably a big red flag, right? You've got to feel comfortable. It's your money. And if you lose it, you're the one that took that risk. Um, and sure enough, you know, she, she came back and said, Hey, I did some due diligence and, you know, thank you. Cause I really realized that it's not a deal I should have been in or want to do. And sure enough, um, it wasn't some months later that they were on the front page of the newspaper for, you know, defrauding people out of their mm -hmm. money. And so, oh, you know, we were not here to recommend, endorse or approve investments, you know, no matter what. And I think sometimes people think that, Hey, if, new view holds this investment it's got to be good because if schwab holds it it's good right and so um, i think it's critical due diligence is probably the most underused tool and we live in a world today where due diligence is at our fingertips i mean heck yep. you know how much you know research can you do on a person in 30 seconds on your phone i could probably tell you where you went to school where you grew up if you've ever been in trouble do you have kids or no kids how many places have you moved have you ever written a review you know it's all there um, so, you know, we, we can't underscore that enough. Where, where do you think, let's kind of, you know, wrap things up, Tim, and, and thanks again for, for being here and, and sharing your wisdom and background with us, but let's maybe wrap up with a little bit of a philosophical question looking out. Where do you see us? What inning do you see us in, in this cycle of the real estate mm -hmm. market? You know, is, is, uh, is there more runway ahead of us? Is there more turbulence ahead of us? Uh, obviously we're asking that with a clear, uh, disclaimer that nobody has a crystal ball. This exactly. Is Tim's opinion, but where, where do you see us? Where are we? Yeah, I was just about to say that because, you know, I do interviews as well. You know, some of the smartest guys in the industry and nobody really knows. And, you know, some are bullish, some are not as bullish. But uh, me personally, you know, depending on, uh, I think it's just some asset classes that are being affected. Uh, but like, I don't see single family homes going to be affected much at all. Um, I think there's still a huge demand. I still see, cause I also do land development stuff side. So I still see the major builders, um, you know, uh, DR Horn, Pulte, Lennar, like they're still aggressively building. Um, and so, 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 so yeah, so I don't see that market being affected much. Um, you know, and then on the commercial side, you know, Multifamily, I, I can totally see turbulence there. Um, you know, industrial warehouses, I don't see a turbulence there. I think that's going to be a really good uh, um, market. Uh, same thing with self storage. I think that's going to be a, a really good market. Um, and so, so yeah, I so I think it's you know, and even office, right? Like, um, uh, you know, one of the things I learned about offices recently that that just blew my mind away. Um, so. So because of COVID, a lot of businesses are now, you know, working from home. So the, the, the offices have gone, the, that asset uh, type has gone down quite a bit. Uh, however, it's a function of supply and demand. And so some of the, uh, some of the, the um, uh, more, ad, uh, more advanced syndicators, developers are now buying office, uh, offices and converting them into multifamily. And so what that does is that they are taking away the supply of offices. Um, and so, so when the supply is going away, the office occupancy is going to go back up. Um, and so now that's happening more in like downtowns uh, of, of major cities. Uh, outskirts probably not happening uh, yet. But, but yeah, so, so um, you know, so, so things, things 
are definitely being converted. Um, and so the smart players, the smart operators will know how to take advantage of these opportunities. But yeah, so it's, um, as you can, I mean, it's not a straight answer. It's not the whole market going to go to, you know, to nothing, but it's just certain asset types. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that's a really good assessment. You know, it's, uh, uh, if, if you had a crystal ball, we'd probably be too scared to actually look at it. Um, you know, we wouldn't quite want to know, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it comes back to, you know, be eyes wide open right now. Uh, there's likely, uh, still some turbulence in certain markets. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of geographics play into it. You know, oh, yeah. you're in Florida, you're, you're in, in, uh, Houston. in Texas and, yep. you know, we're seeing, you know, just the influx of people alone, um, you know, is, is unbelievable. Um, and then we got a lot of things that have to settle themselves out. I mean, you've got a big issue with insurance. We, we do here in yeah. Florida. I know in Texas, you guys are battling it, but you know, th there's still some things that, um, you know, are going to have to be worked out because they're all part of the larger equation that is either single family or multifamily or commercial. So, uh, more, more and more to come, but you know, Tim love, love having you on the show. Um, we're going to get the learn before you burn before, uh, before we let you off the hook completely. Um, we'll throw your information for the Capital Raising Summit, the uh, the Hero event, uh, September 14th through the 16th. We'll put that into the show notes. So uh, if if you're considering, you know, raising capital or, or learning a little bit more, uh, you know, Tim's events are always a great resource, and and Tim himself is a master connector. I'm sure if you emailed him and said you were you heard him on the show uh, and and uh, and wanted to get to the conference, he'd take some time to say hi and and maybe make some introductions while you're there. So. Uh, take advantage of that opportunity in education. So, Tim, as we wrap up here, um, we we end every show with our learn before you burn. I think we talked a little bit about some of your experience already and, and some of the things you learned. But, you know, what is the lesson and experience that you got in your lifetime that really hurt, um, but you're glad you got it? And so how can we help someone maybe get the lesson uh, from that without having to go through the experience that you went through to get it? So what's your learn before you burn, Tim? Yeah, yeah. Well, like I mentioned earlier about the market crash and I didn't seek out for help. I was trying to figure it out myself. That's like the worst mistake ever. Uh, yeah, just, um, you know, if you're going through something, chances are, and it doesn't matter if it's business, investing, if it's relationship, marriage. My wife and I have been together now. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Um, and, you know, no matter what challenges that you have, chances are, Someone has been there, done that, have gone through that. And if you just reach out to them in this market, I mean, in, in today's world, like even just a Facebook post to find out who has been there, that someone will raise their hand and says, yeah, and they're willing to talk you through it. And so, yes, reach out for help. Please do. You know, that's, that's yeah. Uh, like if you just do that, um, it'll, 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 you know, it'll help you navigate through any challenges that you might have so much easier don't try to do it yourself like there's no there's no reason that you you need to do that tim that is amazing learn before you burn guidance uh, wave the white towel it's not a sign of weakness it's a sign of strength so leverage people's knowledge and experience yep. and and uh, i love how you put it someone's been there done that uh, no need to reinvent the wheel let's let's get out of it as quickly as possible so tim thank you so much for being here thanks for taking the time to share your wisdom and experience with us and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you. We'll be out at the uh, the summit. Uh, uh, our team will be there. So looking forward to seeing you guys here uh, just uh, in uh, in September. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason, for having me. And yeah, so looking forward to uh, New View being at our event and yeah, and uh, you know, sharing your service, your amazing service to to our audience as well. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Tim. And and uh, as a reminder to everyone else, if you have not clicked the like, share, or subscribe button, please do so. Uh, also, if you haven't given us a review yet, we certainly hope that we're worthy of your five stars. Um, but help us help the the listeners and community that's looking for content, uh, you know, to at least see us as a viable option. Uh, and we'll continue to be bringing people on that can help us understand uh, how to invest wiser, more efficiently. Uh, and as always, how to keep more of what you earn uh, by good tax strategies. So thanks, everybody. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much for listening. We hope the information within this podcast has given you the tools that you need to find your way to financial independence. We would love to partner with you on this journey. Text ALTS, that's A-L-T-S, to 407-708. 
1853 to learn more about how to get started today. Don't forget to follow us to make sure you don't miss a second of content and we'll see you next week.